Good morning, Grace Bible Church. <laughs> My name's Ryan. You might remember me. <laughs> it's, this is our first Sunday back after a three month sabbatical. It's good to see you all. Uh, good to be here with you all. You don't look any different, and I'm glad to, to see that. Um, I wouldn't normally do this at the beginning, but let me just give you a quick update uh, because a lot of people have been asking. I'll just get it all out there at once. My knee's doing a lot better, except for that pipe that's sticking out of the wall in the hallway, which I ran into this morning. So maybe we should get rid of that. (laughs) But doing a lot better. We thank you for your prayers. Um, It's good to be back. Good to see you all this morning and to be worshiping with you this morning. Uh, Before we begin our time of worship, uh, there are a ton of announcements for you to look at on pages 16 and 17. Um, There's a lot going on today, so let me uh, let you know about that. We have a baptism immediately after the service this morning, so we'll finish the service. If you need to get up and stretch or use the restroom or whatever, you can go and do that. And after about five minutes after the service ends, we'll We'll uh, do the baptism. Jacob Thornburg is going to be baptized this morning. You'll, you'll hear more from him later. Then after the baptism, we have a fellowship meal. So uh, I, am, I think, because I have not been around for this, I think there is seating both upstairs and outside in the side yard for fellowship meal. So uh, I believe that's something new that started with Easter brunch. So uh, if you're visiting with us today, Glad to have you here. You're more than welcome to stick around for both the the baptism and the fellowship meal. We would love to have you and and love to get to know you. Um, So those are two things going on this morning. Then also uh, today is the final day to submit updates for the directory. So for the pictorial directory, if you have a new picture, new info, whatever, uh, you can get that to Robin. And if you're a little late on it, I'm sure she'll let you slide. But there are a number of other save the date items in the bulletin, so make sure you you take a look at those. Um, Some, one of them is later this month, and then the others are next month in July. So with that, we are going to begin our time of worship, and our scripture reading this morning is from Psalm 147. And this section of the psalm, like so many of the psalms, it kind of builds up to um, a climax where we hear God's, that God takes pleasure not in human power, human ingenuity, human strength, but in those who hope in his steadfast love. And steadfast love is one of those rich Uh, Bible phrases, God's steadfast love is his loyal love for his people, his his undying, unbreakable commitment to do his people good. And so this psalm is, is our Lord's invitation to set our hope on his faithfulness, on his loyal love. So please stand and I'll read Psalm 147 verses 7 through 11. Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving, make melody to our God on the lyre. He covers the heavens with clouds, he prepares rain for the earth, he makes grass grow on the hills, he gives to the beasts their food and to the young ravens that cry. His delight is not in the strength of the horse, meaning a war horse, nor his pleasure in the legs of a man, but the Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him in those who hope in his steadfast love. And so we are gathered here this morning as those who hope in God's steadfast love, which he's shown us in Jesus Christ. So let me pray and then we'll sing together. Our God and Father, we count it a great privilege to be here this morning as your sons and daughters adopted through faith in Jesus Christ and We pray that you would meet us here by your spirit, that you would once again pour out your love on us, enable us to rest all of our hope on your steadfast love, which we've found in your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. 
Amen. Well, we are going to join our voices together this morning in praise as we sing, His mercy is more, and then great is thy faithfulness. With this first song, I just wanted to remind you, in the bulletin it's written verse, first verse, chorus. We're going to sing the first two verses together, and then we'll sing the chorus, okay? Thank you. 
Our scripture reading this morning is the book of Philemon. So, hear God's word. Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved fellow worker, and Apphia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and the church in your house. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers because I hear of your love and of the faith that you have toward the Lord Jesus and for all the saints. And I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. For I have derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. Accordingly, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required, yet for love's sake, I prefer to appeal to you. I, Paul, an old man and now a prisoner also for Christ Jesus, I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. Formerly, he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful to you and to me. I am sending him back to you, sending my very heart. I would have been glad to keep him with me in order that he might serve me on your behalf during my imprisonment for the gospel, but I prefer to do nothing without your consent in order that your goodness might not be by compulsion, but of your own accord for this purpose is why he is parted from you for a while, that you might have him back forever, no longer as a bondservant, but more than a bondservant as a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So if you consider me your partner, receive him as you would receive me. If he has wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it, to say nothing of your owing me even your own self. Yes, brother, I want some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I say. At the same time, prepare a guest room for me, for I am hoping that through your prayers I will be graciously given to you. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ, sends greetings to you, as do Mark and Aristarchus, Demas and Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Please pray with me. Our good and gracious Heavenly Father, Father of mercies, God of all comfort, of righteousness, of joy, and of peace, you are the pure and holy light and the abundant life from whom, we, from whom the darkness and death flee away in terror. You are the tree of life. You are the spring of living waters. We have seen through the eyes of our feeble faith your glory shining in the face of Christ. Lord Jesus, we worship you, God from God, light from light the eternally begotten one who assumed our nature and came for us, our great high priest, our helper, our faithful friend and brother. Holy Spirit, we worship you, Lord, the giver of life, the holy, hidden, humble gardener at work in our lives. You skillfully tend to, support and prune and feed the faith of all who belong to you. Our triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit, we worship you, three, and yet one God. O oh God, we confess that we have sinned against you in our thoughts, words, and deeds. We have all done what is evil, and we have all failed to do what we should have done. Have mercy, O oh God, for we trust in the only Redeemer. Thank you for the promise that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We rest all our hope upon the sure rock of your promise. And Father, we come before you with many needs. You know our needs, each one represented here. 
Lord, you see. You know our weak faith. We ask, Lord, that you would strengthen us. We ask that you would be our rock and our fortress. We ask that you would awaken faith where there is death. Lord, we ask for the gift of repentance. We ask that you would do your good work in our life, or that you would bring life out of death, and that you would draw us closer to the Lord Jesus Christ, to commune with him. Lord, sanctify us. Make us useful in this world for your kingdom. Help us, Lord, as witnesses of this kingdom. Lord, to love our neighbors as ourselves. Help us, Lord, to love our closest neighbors, to treat our loved ones in our own home as, Lord, we ought to treat them with the same love with which you've loved us. Forgive us for when we have failed to do this. Lord, help us as your body to grow in our union and uh, communion with one another. Lord, strengthen the bonds that we have in you. We ask for those that are suffering among us, for those who are sick, for those who, um, whose bodies are suffering. Lord, we pray that you bring healing. We pray that you bring comfort and that you would renew their strength. We pray for our world, Lord, as we look out, we see so much darkness and pain and sin and evil. We pray that you would bring, bring peace to the great conflicts that we see in our world. We pray that you would give our leaders in our country great wisdom to know how to navigate these things and that you would um, give them a mind to do the things that work for peace among mankind and that you would work in the minds of the leaders of this world, Lord, to bring an end to suffering and to the despair that we see. Lord, bring peace, we pray. And we pray, Lord, for your church, that your church would be a witness and a testimony in these times of the kingdom of God. Lord, that you would keep us from partisan conflicts and tribalism, Lord, that plagues our land. Help us, Lord, to be representative of your kingdom and to show love and respect to all, even to those who disagree with us. And Lord, we do pray that you would give us, that you would renew your church, that you would send revival, that you would send repentance, that you would cleanse and purge your church of the evil within its institutions and continue to do that work, Lord, even as painful as it is. And Lord, we ask for this local body. We pray that you give the elders and the deacons wisdom as they govern this church and that you would fill them with your spirit and protect them from the evil one. And we pray for ourselves, Lord, for each and every one here, that as we leave from this place and as we work in our vocations, that we would do all to the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is in his name that we pray. Amen. If you're able to sing how deep the Father's love for us. Yeah. 
It's such a blessing to be able to gather as God's people, sing about the truths of the gospel, and then hear those truths through God's word and pray those things back to the Lord. This morning we begin a brief series through the book of Philemon. And part of the reason it's a brief series is because it is the shortest of Paul's letters. There are other shorter books in the Bible, but it's the shortest of Paul's letters. As you just heard in our scripture reading, it can be read in less than three minutes, but I'll, my sermon will be longer than that. Uh, yeah. And we're going to do three sermons on it, so um, each of those minutes will make into 30 or 40. So, um, But although the letter is short, it is, it is very significant, and I'm really looking forward to what the Lord is going to teach us as we look at it together. And so as we begin this morning, we can just think for a moment on the question, why study Philemon? Um, you're welcome to turn there even as, as we're addressing these things. It's on page 1000 in the Pew Bible. It's also printed, uh, the text we'll be looking at is printed on page 9. Um, and you can turn to it in your Bibles as well. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit by way of intro, and then we'll look at the introduction of this book together this morning. But why study the book of Philemon? One of the reasons is it's actually very closely related to the book of Colossians. Even though they don't appear next to each other in our Bibles, they were probably delivered at the same time by Tychicus, and Onesimus was accompanying him. And this book involves many of the same people that we heard about as we heard the ending of the book of Colossians. And so some of those names may sound familiar to you. Also, thematically, it continues some of the concepts that we were talking about, in, in particular as we finished up Colossians, um, especially with what Nate was preaching about how being in Christ and that the union that we have in him also connects us to one another. And that union in him and together really changes everything about our relationships. And the situation that's addressed in this letter to Philemon is one of the most powerful applications, I think, of those truths. It's really kind of a case study of how do we take what Paul was saying in Colossians and what he says all throughout the New Testament, and how do we apply this when the rubber meets the road? Uh, this, the situation overall is that this letter is addressed primarily to a man named Philemon. It seems that he was a wealthy, involved member at the church at Colossae. Uh, he must have had enough resources to have 25 to 40 people meeting in his home every Sunday and to provide donuts and coffee. 
I don't know about the donuts and coffee, but a house big enough for that many people, especially in that day, we find that those who had house churches in their home were people of considerable means. And so Philemon was most likely a man of means. And as a person of means, he also had at least one slave or bondservant named Onesimus. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we continue. But just for the sake of the story, Onesimus ran away. And it seems like he also stole from Philemon. Verse 18 seems to indicate that, that he may owe something to Philemon. And somehow, in the process of running away, he encounters the Apostle Paul. Now, we're not sure how this took place. Some speculate that he actually ran to the Apostle Paul because he knew that Philemon respected Paul and Onesimus wanted the situation uh, in that house addressed. And so perhaps he intentionally went and found Paul. Uh, that's a theory that's out there. The, the other option is that somehow he crossed paths with Paul when Paul was under house arrest and providentially encountered him. Either way is providential, uh, but we're just not sure the circumstances under it, of, of it. But during his time with Paul, the most amazing thing happens. Onesimus becomes a Christian, and Paul says that he was useful to him while Paul was there under house arrest. And although Paul would love to keep Onesimus with him, he's sending him back to Philemon with this letter so that things can be made right between master and runaway slave. Now, that's a situation, isn't it? That's a sticky situation to apply the gospel. Imagine for a moment how scary this must have been for Onesimus. He finds Paul, this great father, mentor in the faith. His life has changed. And then Paul says to him, I'm sending you back to Philemon, but don't worry, I'm giving you a letter. <laughs> I, do you know what's in that letter? I, I would have no idea. But, but under the legalities of the day, Onesimus could have been se severely punished by Philemon for what he did, if not killed, uh, just depending on how one would interpret the law. But it, it's not only that there's intense pressure in this situation for Onesimus. Think about what this means for Philemon. He's a leader in this church overall. Everyone in the church will be watching how he will handle this situation of the runaway slave returned. And not only will the church be watching, but the community will be watching. And there will be intense pressure upon Philemon for how he deals with his runaway slave and what that does to the order of society. And so the, the question really is how should Philemon, Onesimus' owner, respond and how should the church respond in light of this news? And we'll be considering how Paul deals with this situation over the next three weeks. Now, you may be wondering, why is such a short and specific letter in our Bibles, right? Our Bibles contain all kinds of other things that apply much more broadly. I mean, none of us here is facing this exact situation. Thankfully for us, slavery is not allowed, it is not legal in our land. And so none of us is ex experiencing this exactly in the same way. But... The beauty of this letter is that the way Paul handles this weighty, complicated situation has profound implications, not only for how we handle tricky situations in our lives, but really, as we listen to what Paul says, it has profound implications for how we view our Christian life and our Christian life together overall. You see, the goal of this letter isn't so much that we'll be able to answer the question, if my slave runs away, what do I do? Because if that's the question, we could just skip three weeks and move on. But the question that it's raising is, how does being a Christian so radically change my life that I would know how to approach this situation in the way that Jesus would? And that's what Paul is beautifully unfolding here. So we'll consider the first section of this letter this morning, uh, verses 1 through 7. So I will read those, and then we'll pray, and then we will dive into the letter specifically. Again, this is Philemon. We'll be looking at verses 1 through 7. Hear God's word. 
Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved fellow worker, and Aphia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and the church in your house. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers because I hear of your love and of the faith that you have toward the, love, toward the Lord Jesus and for all the saints. And I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. For I have derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. So far, the reading of God's word. Let's pray and ask his help as we consider it together. Our Father in heaven, we pray that you would meet us in our need this morning. We are humbled by the fact that you know our very hearts. We don't even know the depths of what is going on in our hearts and in our souls, but you do. And you know exactly what we need. And you have given us your word to show us the beauty of your gospel so that we could become more like Jesus. And so we pray that this morning, as, as we think about these things together, that your Holy Spirit would give us hearts of faith, that he would illumine the text for us, that he would help us to see the beauty and wonder of our Savior and of your love for us in Christ Jesus. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Well, as we look at this section this morning, uh, we'll consider it in two points, and they're really relatively simple, uh, the issue and the approach. We'll consider what the issue is, and we'll consider what Paul's approach to it is. And so first of all, let's consider the issue in verses 1 through 3. What is the central concern in this letter? What is it that Paul is really focusing upon and concerned about. Well, as we kind of mentioned already in the introduction, an overarching situation in the book is slavery. Now, we may hear that term and often think of our closest expression of it, and that's the African slavery that was present in the United States for hundreds of years. And while the slavery in Paul's day did deprive people of their rights and it could be severely abused, it is different from the type of slavery that was practiced in our country. In our country and in Britain, a whole race of people was believed to be inferior because of the color of their skin. They were stolen from their homeland and there was really no possibility for freedom from that for them because of the color of their skin. The slavery that Paul's addressing was more of a socioeconomic system that's in place, although it did have abuses, but it wasn't driven by the color of one's skin. And so that's why some of our translations use the term bondservant instead of slave, because they're trying to help us differentiate that although there's overlap, there are differences, especially in um, the systemic nature of what was taking place here. And so while this overarching situation that's behind the letter of Philemon involves slavery in the first century, Paul is not concerned here with dealing with slavery as an institution. This is not a treatise on what Christians should think or do about the institution of slavery. That's an important question. The Bible actually has a lot to say about that, and there is a place for that. And if that's something you're wondering about or wrestling with, I'd love to talk more about it. We have talked about it some as we studied Exodus, some as we studied these various epistles. For the sake of time, I'm not going to go into that right now. But there's a lot that can be said to, to help you as you wrestle through that conundrum that the scriptures do raise of how do we think about slavery as an institution. But that's not Paul's concern here. And actually, in this letter, he's surprisingly not even very concerned with the circumstances that are related to slavery. 
as you heard Nate read the whole letter in our scripture reading, isn't it kind of surprising that in dealing with this dicey situation, we don't have Paul saying, Philemon, what are your rights as a master? Onesimus, what rights do you has, have as a slave? And let's, let's think through those logistics of those circumstantial things. Paul surely knows those things. He knows Roman law of the day, and this, these things are common practice uh, with the lifestyle of the church. But that's not where Paul takes it in this letter. So what does Paul see as the main issue as he speaks into this situation? Well, the main issue is who they are in Christ. It's who they are in Christ. This letter is short. It's 335 words in the original, shorter than a lot of blog posts. You could, I mean, a few flips of the thumb and you are through it on your screen. But in those 335 words, do you know how many times Paul mentions the Lord Jesus in some way? 11 times. He can barely go a sentence or two without somehow bringing it back to the Lord Jesus Christ and the difference he makes in this situation. If Paul were to take this letter and submit it to uh, his English professor or Greek professor is probably what that would be in Paul's day, and, and she were to read it, she would probably hand it back to him and say, this needs a little more work. It is quite redundant. <laughs> we should uh, sub some of these references to Jesus out of it. But Paul would say, no, this isn't redundant. It's important. Being in Christ is the issue that we need to understand as then we think about the situation that's before us. And so being in Christ is the issue. And then in our passage this morning, there are really two aspects of being in Christ that he highlights. And the first is that being in Christ means that they are a family. For Paul, being in Christ means they are a family. Did you hear all of the family language throughout the letter? Right away in verse 1, it's from Paul and Timothy, who is their brother. Philemon himself is beloved. That's a, a family love term. And Paul repeatedly refers to Philemon in the singular as his brother. That's really rare for Paul. Paul speaks of brothers and sisters all the time as the family of God. But when he speaks to Philemon, it's the singular, you are my brother, Philemon. And then we have Apthia. And we're not sure exactly who she is. She was likely Philemon's wife, who would have had a lot to say in this situation because um, as Philemon's wife, she would have been the one who primarily oversaw what was taking place in the home and in particular amongst the slaves. But she is referred to as our sister. And what we see is this personal, what we would usually consider as a private issue, right, of what goes on in Philemon's house is not only addressed to Philemon, but Archippus is also uh, mentioned and at the end of verse 2, the whole church that meets in his house. Sometimes we say, like, don't air our family's dirty laundry. Um, whatever that means, Paul's doing it here. <laughs> I, this personal letter to Philemon, I want the whole church to be reading this. Why? Because this is what in our world would be considered a private household or, or even business issue, Paul sees it as a family issue because they have been made family in the Lord Jesus Christ. And this family dynamic is especially crucial because what has happened? Philemon's runaway slave, Onesimus, has now become what? A child in the faith. Paul is his father now in the faith, Onesimus, his child, and he's no longer merely Philemon's bondservant, but now he's his beloved brother in the Lord. And so what difference does that make as he returns? It's, it's their identity in the Lord Jesus Christ that Paul wants Philemon and all of them to consider as Onesimus comes back 
and this letter comes to them. And so the main issue is who they are in Christ. Part of that means that they are a family, but then secondly, being in Christ means that they are people of grace and peace. They are people of grace and peace. Paul begins his letter as he usually does. He mentions who it's from, then who it's to, and then he goes into these little words, grace and peace. It can be so easy for us to gloss over them, can it? Especially if you've been a Christian for a while and you've read Paul's epistles. Oh yeah, verse 3 is always grace and peace. Da, 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 da. What's, when do we get to the like, what are we supposed to do part of this letter, right? But no, um, these words are not throwaway words for Paul. And what Paul is actually doing is he's intentionally taking the writing conventions of his day. Paul went to school and learned how you write a letter, where all the different parts go, right? And then he says, you know what? Now that I'm in Christ, I've learned the form and I want to supercharge it with theology. That's what he does. And so instead of just saying greetings, which is what you're supposed to put at verse 3 of a letter, basically, first thing, greetings, he says grace to you. That's what he wants to be conveyed to them. He begins his letter with grace. And I don't know if you noticed when Nate was reading it in verse 25, he ends the letter with grace. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Because they, as those who are in Christ, are a people who from start to finish are shaped by the grace of God. It is the grace of God that has come to them in salvation and taken them from sinners who were outside the promises of God to those who are now beloved children of God and family together. And it's the grace of God that is going to keep them faithful. And it is the grace of God that they need in this situation to act as the family of God and brothers and sisters of the Lord Jesus himself. And so what he conveys to them is grace to you as his greeting. And then instead, what you'd normally write next is your general wishes for them. Usually the polite thing of like, I wish you well. Greetings, I wish you well. Paul says, no, 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 no. Grace to you. And you know what I wish for you? Peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. They are at peace with God through the work of the Lord Jesus, aren't they? And his wish as he writes this letter is that they would experience this peace among them more and more as this letter comes to them and does its work in them. So do you see what Paul does here? He shifts the focus from the issue and the circumstances. What does he shift it to? their identity, their identity in the Lord Jesus Christ. What he asks of them as the letter is written is, who are you? Who is Philemon? Who is Onesimus? Who is Paul? And who are they in Christ who is all and in all? They are a family in the Lord, and they are a people of grace and peace. And so the issue that he's asking them to consider is how God's grace and his peace are breaking into this situation that they find before them. What are the difficult situations that you are facing in your life? Is it problems with a team or some individuals at work or at school? Difficulties in your family, maybe with your spouse, with your children, with siblings, with parents, trouble with a friend, difficulties from ongoing hurts in the church, or are the struggles that you're facing what feel like more of private struggles of the soul, the ongoing loss of a body that's breaking down, the overwhelming anxieties and cares of this world, the relentless cloud of despair, a disheartening battle with sin. 
What would Paul's letter to you say in that situation? Another way we could phrase that, what is God's word to you in the midst of that difficulty? I'd imagine that Paul's letter, and God's word, would begin with who you are, wouldn't it? That by God's grace, you are now, even in the midst of that storm, you are at peace with God through the work of Jesus Christ. And his grace is no less yours than when it was that he brought you to faith to experience the wonder of that salvation. You are a person of grace and peace. But not only that, when we think of who we are in Christ, part of what it reminds us of, you are not an island. And on the one hand, what that means is there's accountability for how we treat one another. It shapes what our responses can be, doesn't it? As we are family in the faith. But the, the flip side of that is also that you are united to and in fellowship with other brothers and sisters in the Lord, fathers and mothers in the Lord. You are not alone in the difficulties that you face. And there are people here and in the body of Christ, even beyond these doors, who can love you, care for you, pray for you, shoulder the burden with you, because you're in Jesus together. And so whatever the situation you find yourself in, a good place to start is with your true identity as one who is in Christ by faith in him. And if that doesn't describe you today, hear the call throughout the service that there is a God who loves sinners so much that if you turn to Christ in faith, you can be united to him, brought into the family of God, and become a person of grace and peace who has family in the Lord. And so we've seen then the amazing way that Paul frames up this issue. It's about your identity in Jesus, this family identity that you have. I find that amazing. What I find even more amazing then is Paul's approach, how he walks these believers through this. And that leads us to our second point. We've considered the issue. Now we will consider the approach. And we'll do that by looking at verses 4 to 7. With a complicated issue of the Christian life like this, this is kind of a pastoral conundrum, right? This is a, a tricky counseling thing. This is something that we as a church would be like, hmm, how should this go down? We are often tempted toward one of two approaches. We either lower the bar of what it means to be in Christ and family together, and so what it really amounts to is we just kind of boil it down to, you know what, we're really just individuals doing our own thing with our own Jesus, and the only shared life is about an hour and a half here. Um, and so Paul's letter would say something like, here's Onesimus, do what you wish, uh, it doesn't affect me, hope it goes well. <laughs> it's lowering the bar of what being in Christ really means, right? On the other hand, as we read our Bibles and take it seriously, we may see the weightiness of the situation, right? We are interconnected in Christ. This is a family issue. This, this really matters. And we think that this connection means that we all share control. <laughs> and so what happens is we realize if, if we're a family— and if what you do affects me, then you need to do what I would do or what I would want you to do. Otherwise, this thing's going to get really dicey. And it's, it's really this heavy-handed kind of tyrannical approach is what ends up happening. Many of us have experienced this in the church in various ways. Heavy-handed church leaders coming in under the banner of helping you grow and assessing your life and condemning the things that don't look like the way they tend to do things and not doing things according to the way they would do it. 
Or it can look like other church members thinking that it was their right to come in and, and just make pronouncements on the way that you choose to do the Christian life, telling you what you should feel and what you should do in a heavy-handed way. Paul doesn't go to either extreme. And it's just masterful what he does. And it has so much to teach us, both as those who come as in positions of authority in the church, or if you find yourself in more of a mentor or disciple role, um, but also for all of us as fellow church members, how does Paul navigate this? What is his approach? I want us to just briefly notice four aspects of what Paul does that then we'll be aware of as then we unpack these things in the following weeks. The first thing that Paul does is he emphasizes their equality in the Lord. He emphasizes their equality in the Lord. Paul goes out of his way in this letter to downplay his authority and to downplay his apostleship. It's not that it's not there. It's just that it's not front and center, and he's trying not to make that the issue. Instead, he's trying to highlight how he's one with them, both with Philemon and with Onesimus. This is the only letter where Paul introduces himself as a prisoner. And throughout it, he mentions his imprisonment four times. Now, there could be multiple reasons. I mean, he's probably composing this while in prison, so it's on his mind. But I think there's more to it than that. He's intentionally showing his lowly status, and he's identifying himself as in the same status that Onesimus deserves for what he has done. And in this letter, Paul never once mentions that he's an apostle, but instead he repeatedly speaks of others as fellow workers. He's emphasizing their equality in the Lord. Secondly, he affirms Philemon's dignity in the Lord. While he brings himself low, he raises Philemon up. He speaks to Philemon very much as a peer. In verse 2, he's a fellow worker. In verse 7, he says, you're my brother. And he says that again in verse 20. In verse 17, he calls him his partner. And so uh, he's emphasizing the dignity of Philemon. And in, in doing so, he's not heavy-handed. And he goes out of his way not to force Philemon into a specific response. Instead, in verse 14, he says he doesn't want to do anything without Philemon's consent. And he doesn't want this situation or the good that Philemon can do in it to be one of compulsion. Do you see that, that dignity there? Philemon is a responsible individual Christian before the Lord. And Paul treats him with that dignity as a brother and as he would with a sister. And so he affirms Philemon's dignity in the Lord. Third, he affirms Philemon's character in the Lord. In the introduction, verses 1 and 2, 1 through 3, Paul begins inclusively, right? He's bringing the whole church into the letter, and he's using the plural when he says you. But then in verse 4, he shifts to the singular, and he speaks directly to Philemon. And what does he say? Paul says that he remembers, that he mentions Philemon in his prayers. Really, that saying, when he prays for him by name. We don't even know if he's ever met Philemon. He's praying for him by name. And when he prays for Philemon, what happens? He thanks God for him. Why? Because of the faith and love that he has heard of in his brother in Christ. Verse 7 says that Paul himself experiences joy. He, he rejoices. He's comforted or encouraged. When, when life is hard and he is down, you know what encourages Paul? Those things he's heard about how Philemon is loving other people in Colossae. And he says, he, he puts this beautiful flourish on it. He says, the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. 
So often we're saying, what does it look like to love another brother or sister in the Lord? Here's such a beautiful snippet of part of what it means. Philemon's love refreshes people. It means that it gives them relief from the toils of life in a fallen world. It brings them a deep feeling. He says they've experienced the hearts of the saints have been refreshed. He's not using the normal word for heart. He's using the, the inner parts, the guts. They, in their deepest emotion, have felt rest when Philemon enters in to love. Just as Jesus said that in him, people find rest for their souls. Do you see what Paul's doing here? He affirms Philemon's character in the Lord. Your faith and your love are evident and people are refreshed and I hear about it and I rejoice and it comforts me. Then finally, verse four, not verse four, number four, he prays for Philemon to respond in the Lord. He affirms his character, but then he prays for Philemon to respond now in the Lord. Verse 6 is a complicated verse to translate. Uh, and you can kind of tell that because of how it's even worded in the English. It's a little hard for us to understand. Let me read verse 6 and then just unpack briefly what, it, what it's saying, and then, and then we'll just tie it together. Verse 6 says, and I, I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. I think one of the things that throws me as soon as I read that verse is he's praying about the sharing of your faith. And when you hear that, what do you think of? Evangelism, right? Sharing your faith with a person who doesn't have faith or with an unbeliever. That's not what it's talking about. That sharing of your faith, it's koinonia, right? It's sharing together in a common faith. And so what, what's, what he's talking about here is the faith that you share with the other believers, this common faith you have in the Lord Jesus, I'm praying that it will become effective. And, and what is it producing? What's, what's the effect of it? That it would lead to this full knowledge of every good thing. He wants Philemon to know even more these good things in them. Another way that Paul says it is these good things that God has prepared in advance for us to walk in, and it's all for the sake of or for the glory of or the pleasure of Jesus Christ. And so what is Paul's approach here as we put it all together? It's thankful prayer for faith and love. Paul is involved in thankful prayer for faith and love. He has prayerfully thanked God for Philemon's faith and love. And now he prays that Philemon's faith would continue to grow, that Philemon would come to fully know the good thing that he can do so that in this particular situation, he can show the love of Christ that he would do what is good and that Paul would be refreshed now as Philemon receives Onesimus. I find it fascinating that when Paul comes to a situation like this, he isn't freaking out. <laughs> I'd be tempted to be like, oh boy, this is going to be a bombshell for the church at Colossae. We're sending Onesimus back. I know that's the right thing to do. I don't know how they're going to take it. And I put 335 words would become like this book of like all kinds of caveats and things like that. Paul's not freaking out. Why? Why isn't he worried like that in this situation? He has a habit of prayerful gratitude for God's grace. He is listening for He's encouraged by, he's comforted with what he hears about how God's grace is on display in the lives of others, and in particular in the life of Philemon. And so he's been thanking God for this so he can confidently pray that that would continue even in this situation. G.K. Beale says, part of participating in divine grace, grace to you, right? Right? Part of the participating in that 
is to recognize it. And this can begin with thanksgiving. We're to be on the lookout for evidences of grace in the lives of other believers. I think it's probably an understatement to say that it has been an abnormally difficult few years. I haven't yet talked to anyone who disagrees with me on that. And all in various ways, we've been through a lot as individuals and as a church. But all throughout these last few years, there are evidences of the grace of God, aren't there? And it's one of my privileges as a pastor that I feel like the Apostle Paul many times because as I talk with you all, I hear just in passing what other people are doing and the grace that is coming to you. The refreshment that other believers are bringing to you through their love. And I confess that as I've read this and thought about what Paul does, I realize this is something that's lacking in my life. It's so easy to focus on the problem and the situation and how are we going to fix it? How are we going to make it through the next few years? It doesn't seem like they're going to get easier, right? And we skip over that step of, of God saying, but wait a minute, but wait a minute. Grace is on display. Refreshment is happening. And so I just want to take a moment just to remind us all that God's grace is on display in Grace Bible Church. That I hear over and over again as people are going through difficult situations of the meals that show up at their door, of the calls that come to them in care and concern, of cards that arrive, of listening ears, of burdens carried, of rides given, of quilts that are sent, of computers that are fixed, and bills that are helped with, and companions who come along in the sorrow and the difficulty and shoulder it with you and cry out and lament and complain, but take it to God together. God's work is happening among us. And part of the beauty of this is God's work and his grace is happening in you as well. If you are in Christ, it is happening. The problem usually is we can't see it, right? But I guarantee you others probably do. And so one of the beautiful things that we can do for one another is we recognize it and we take it to the Lord and we thank him for it. But then we do what Paul does here and we say, I see God's grace and how even though you're beset by doubts and difficulties and trials, you keep showing up, you keep looking to the Lord and you keep reaching out to his people for help. I see his grace. I hear of the refreshment that you bring. And we can pray that in whatever the next phase would be, that God would give us the grace to continue to grow in the experience of his peace as heaven has broken in upon us as his people. And so could our commitment be, as we go through Philemon and beyond, with whatever the next phase of our earthly pilgrimage entails, and it's probably not ease and bliss <laughs> until our Lord Jesus returns, but could what we be devoted to as leaders and as a flock be to thankful prayer for faith and love? To be on the lookout for it in the lives of others? To be on the lookout for it as grace meets us each and every day? And as we grow in this thankful prayer, we really echo those beautiful words that John Newton wrote in the third stanza of Amazing Grace. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. Tis grace has brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. And so, 
Paul's approach has been cultivated in him for years. <laughs> and then it just spills out into his confidence that grace can help Philemon and Onesimus and the church be the family of grace and peace that the Lord Jesus has made them. We are facing many situations that are difficult for us. I don't know what your situation is. I know about some of them. I'm sure there are many more. Wouldn't it be great if we had a letter from Paul, if you had a letter from Paul to help you deal with that situation that you're in, one that helped you focus on the real issue, reminded you of your identity in the Lord Jesus, and brought you again and again to the grace and the peace of God. And wouldn't it be great if like in Paul's day, that letter was read to your whole spiritual family and it reminded you that you're not alone, but that you're all in this together. And wouldn't it be amazing if after hearing it, you had an opportunity to respond with some kind of activity that reminded us that we're all seated together at the family of God with our older brother, the Lord Jesus, that we're all recipients of his grace, sharing in his peace because of what Jesus has done through the blood of the new covenant. I think that'd be really helpful. Maybe we could do that every week. I'm being facetious. But the prayer really is that God would help us to see and to receive that help today and each week as we gather together to grow as a family of faith and love. Let me pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your relentless love for us, that your grace superabounds even in the face of our sin and our weakness. We thank you that we have received peace through the Lord Jesus Christ and that it is growing in our lives. We want to experience it more and more. And we thank you that one day we will experience the forever peace that we were made for, dwelling together with you forever as your people and with you forever with us as our God. We pray that you would help us in this grace until that day. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, in case you didn't make the connection there at the end, Craig was talking about the Lord's Supper as a, a fitting response, a fitting enactment of our unity in Christ, of the fact that we are brothers and sisters in the Lord because of the grace of God, because of all that Christ has done for us. And so this week, just as we do every week, we are going to celebrate that by eating and drinking together, just as the Lord Jesus commanded us to do. And so if, if you are a baptized Christian, uh, we welcome you to participate with us. We welcome you to eat and drink in celebration of all that Christ has done for us and, and all that means for us as the people of God um, in order to just further help us prepare for the supper we're going to sing together a, a song that that highlights just the the glory and the greatness of what Christ has done the power of the cross the lyrics are printed there on page 11 in your bulletin or you can follow along in the songbook it's number 100 and Seven, and so you may remain seated and we'll sing together.
Let me pray for us before we eat and drink together. Our God and Father, once again, we come before you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and we give you thanks for your kindness, for your goodness, for your mercy and grace that you've showered on us through the life, death, resurrection, and ongoing intercession of your Son for us. We are here this morning, Father, as, as people who know we don't deserve your favor and yet are so thankful that your mercy is, is greater than our sin and greater than our rebellion. And so this morning, Father, would you strengthen us by the power of your Holy Spirit as we eat and drink in remembrance of Christ. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the Apostle Paul told the church, I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, 
that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's eat together. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's drink together. Brothers and sisters, Christ has died, Christ is risen, and Christ will come again. And that is our great hope. Amen. Well, we are going to sing a song of response, one we have not done in quite some time, I think. Uh, my heart is filled with thankfulness. I mean, what else can we say after we've heard and thought about all that Christ has done for us? We can just say, thank you, Lord. So please stand and we'll sing together. benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.